passé oh oui Bien sûr que t'es passé oh, deux. Maintenant faut que ça aille au bout Allez Ouais c'est bien joué Il y a plus qu'à la pousser Il y a plus qu'à la pousser au fond Voilà C'est pénalty ça C'est fait Les bleus qui reviennent dans le match Et elle a encore le droit de rêver Avec le pied droit Quel toucher de balle extraordinaire Là il y a un bon ballon de contre à jouer Bien fait, bien fait le. Le centre en fait. Oh, 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 le you maybe salut to le monde i guess uh, we have to go french there because uh, a, a great spot for the women's world cup happening right now in australia and new zealand um the telecommunications provider orange with that and we'll talk about that a little bit more but we are talking about world cup uh we got two great guests that i'll be bringing in here shortly in the before we get started though a reminder that we have a bread spank a new website thinknw.org Uh, if you are a member, thank you so much for your support. If you're not a member, please visit thinknw.org and see this platform that we are continuing to build to help you build your success, whether you are an individual or whether you are a company. That could be an agency, that could be a brand. We're very excited about where we're headed with the site and the organization, and we invite you to join. As always, you can get in touch with me at Zanger, Z A N G E R at thinknw.org. Uh, again, we saw a great spot from, from Orange uh, for the Women's World Cup, and we got one coming up real quick, real quick. Cotter's over, and we're heading to the U.S., Canada, and Mexico in short order and bringing our guests in today so that we can talk about this. Lauren Anderson, director of the Warsaw Sports Business Center at the University of Oregon. Carl Keating founder of the Perfect Storm Lab. Carl has worked with many brands in the Pacific Northwest, including Adidas and Nike. Thank you both for joining me today and uh, glad that we're going to have a little conversation. A reminder to everybody joining us live, if you do have questions, go ahead and put them in the comments and we will do our level best to answer them. So let's, let's get a lay of the land at the moment. So usually when one World Cup wraps, The other gets cooking instantly. And that's not to say that the planning hadn't started many, many years prior for 2026. Um, but it's a little bit different this time around. There's going to be more teams, more brands, more sponsors, and a geography that's spread out between the United States, Mexico, and Canada. Let's break it down into the state of play at the moment. Uh, and as always, feel free to use some historical context to tee this up. Carl, let's start with you. Yeah, well, first of all, thanks for having us on, uh, Doug. I know this is just looking at the audience joining this. I mean, it's an amazing collective of creatives, marketing strategists, all in the Northwest. Um, so this is a fun topic. We're really only on step, you know, seven of 100 when it comes to planning for the 2026 World Cup. So this is perfect timing. Um, yeah, zooming out kind of the macro picture, right? So this is only the third time in history that the World Cup obviously every four years has come to North America. Um, you know, it was Mexico 86, then US 94, which launched, you know, MLS on the back of that, you know, a huge sea change in, in the world of soccer in the US. And now, you know, again, a generation later uh, with the first time ever three countries are going to be hosting 
the World Cup uh, across North America, so the biggest geographic span. Um, and also, it's the first time that the World Cup has expanded from 32 countries up to 48. So it's really the most inclusive World Cup. You know, a lot of expansion in African nations, Asian nations um, are going to be a part of it now. Uh, so those are the two biggest things. Um, obviously, I mentioned, you know, 94 launched the MLS. Um, so there's going to be a massive amount of shift, both in interest. You can see here, you know, the first fun fact I always give out is the viewership of the World Cup. We know it's massive, but it's actually 10x what the Super Bowl is annually. Um, you know, so if you just think of that 10 times, you know, what the biggest ads, the biggest interest in the U.S. is, uh, it's really apples and oranges. Um, and this is another fun fact. This is pretty much the second one I give out, you know, having Lauren and I having worked for Nike, having worked for Adidas. This one blew my socks off when I first kind of uncovered it. You know, 94 to 96, this window was Nike's fastest growth in history. You know, Michael Jordan was retired. Oftentimes, uh, you know, people think it's due to him. But, you know, Nike had just signed on with Brazil at that point. Um, I'm sure many of the folks on, on the chat today, you know, even remember that or were working around it at that point. But it really accelerated this hockey stick because it accelerated passion in sport, youth sports, interest in soccer. And we're going to get this again 30 years later with 26 and then L.A. in 28. Um, so that's kind of the macro picture. Mm -hmm. You know, if there's one other thing I would just add, it's that, you know, coming off of Russia... 2018 and then Qatar 2022, there really is an opportunity for 26 to, you know, sh shift, I think, how we're approaching uh, diversity, inclusion, sustainability, uh, knowing that FIFA, you know, there were definitely a lot of issues out of those last two World Cups that hopefully uh, North America and the Pacific Northwest in, in particular can really do to advance this moment in time uh, for those causes as well. Okay, Lauren, let's move on to the the micro picture, as it were. Sure, sure. Well, um, you know, first and foremost, thanks again. Um, like Carl said, I'm super excited to be here. Um, Carl and I have had a long history working together at both Nike and Adidas and we've crossed paths on the World Cup. So it's fun for us to be um, talking through this a little bit. Um, you know, when we start to look at what's going on, um, with just the roadmap of soccer in the United States right now, like really, I mean, the excitement, we are peaking. Um, there's another, it's funny, Carl started talking about this with the hockey stick after the, the last World Cup um, in the States. You start, you look at where the next ho hockey stick is, and really it's coming with Messi coming into uh, right. the MLS. I mean, it's happening right now. I mean, he got off to a good start. He got off to kind of a good start, you know, made a little impact, right, scored right. goals, you know, had mm -hmm. a few celebs, you know, attend a game or two. It is and coming a Kardashian out. or two. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it's been, it's been interesting um, to just see how the world has now turned its focus to soccer in the United States. Like, who right. thought that there'd be global conversations? Um, you know, in large part, thanks to a great partnership with Apple and, and their TV uh, distribution deal with the MLS, um, you know, going with that and the Women's World Cup right now, just a ton of conversation around the sport. And then, you know, we're moving into some really exciting times of just additional FIFA um, footprints uh, coming up, the new, you know, running through the the club, the new club right. tournament mm -hmm. that's going to be coming um, to the United States in 25 um, and then leading up to 06, I mean, there's just an unprecedented amount of, of soccer that's going to be happening. And with it coming here, you know, on our home turf, so to speak. Right. Um, I think you're really going to see it come to life in a new way. And potentially right. the Women's World Cup in 27, the next yep. one, uh, which is still TBD, but the U.S. Yep. is at the top of that list. Right. So, and, right. If it, and if it doesn't happen in 27, we'll for sure get the, yeah. the one after that. So. Yeah, let's take a look at the map because, you know, we have these venues uh, yep. here spread out. Um, uh, a little surprised that Denver didn't get one, but I, I'm just going to save my yeah. editorial comment for that. But uh, uh, <laughs> it's okay, but I, but I will agree. I mean, Denver's a great, it's a great soccer market. So it's mm -hmm. so interesting. But I think, you know, really with the two cities in Canada, the three, the three in Mexico, and then the other 11 sites in the United States, you can kind of see there are some pods. So yeah. you know, as Carl was talking about the expansion of the field, they kind of had to 
I think the selections were based on city clusters that were going to make the most sense and make maybe make travel a little bit easier. Right. Um, one would also like to think somebody might have thought about weather patterns and that sometimes sometimes Denver Denver can get a little dicey. So yeah. well, yeah, yeah. No, that's that's no, that's that's very very true. Um, um, but you you mentioned to me before that this is the first time ever that FIFA is allowing host cities to bring on local partners. So talk a little bit about that, Lauren. Well, yeah, it's, I mean, if you think about what makes, what makes each of these regions different, it, it is going to be the local flavor that, that is accustomed to leveraging a sports event, uh, let alone something on this big stage. So, um, you know, it's a chance, it's a chance for FIFA obviously to dig into some pockets that they're not normally reaching into and brands that aren't going to be able to afford the normal buy-in to be up at the big kids table, so to speak, mm -hmm. um, from a sponsorship standpoint. But man, with the number of, of fans that are going to be traveling to these cities and these regions, like it's a great opportunity to sort of open the door and shine the light on some different categories and different brands um, to, that are really going to be locally relevant and yeah. making making these things different and exciting in every one of these venues. So mm -hmm. it, it's going to be interesting to see who really comes to the table and what new categories are unlocked. Yep. Yeah, I mean, a great example there is Seattle. You know, I, for those who are on the call or listening in, um, as I mentioned, we're really only at step six, five or six of this process. September, um, having spoken to a number of the host cities already, New York, um, New Jersey team and, and Vancouver, um, they've indicated that FIFA is going to release the uh, remaining kind of match allotment and finals information in September, which will really set the partnership selling, sponsorship involvement, localization of those 10 partners per host city on mm -hmm. fire um, starting just in September because they've, you know, when waiting on that information from FIFA. Right. You can see what Seattle's doing already. They've signed one legacy partner. Uh, yeah, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, because we'll go in a little bit more depth about the Pacific Northwest. But let's talk about host cities jockeying for position because that does bring up a good point. It's, it, I mean, it represents just an absolutely massive amount of economic potential. Investment be damned, I suppose. Uh, Lauren, let's start with you. What are the key benefits for a host city, especially uh, getting into the final? Well, well, obviously, I mean, the first and foremost, you know, you you think about the tourism dollars. I mean, that mm -hmm. that that's pretty much a no brainer. Um, that's going to be an opportunity um, to tap into just the, the local resources. But I think what what really beyond sort of the day of the day of play. The, the bigger piece of this here is like, how does the how does the region and how does the, the site unlock mm. other opportunities and how are we unlocking training sites, for example? Um, right. And and really, really, if you take a look, um, uh, we've got a map here of what's happening in Australia right now. Right. So, you know, you've got the cities where the games are, but these are all the other venues that are being impacted by national training camps and people coming in. Um, you're going to have not only the national teams and their delegations coming in, you also have their supporting brand and sponsors, national team sponsors coming in with them. So, so it levels up that, that sense of play. Mm -hmm. Australia, if you, if you mirror this, you know, Australia is about the same size as the United States as a whole. Right. So they've, they've got fewer cities here, but they're unlocking that. So if you start to think about the United States and then particularly if you can flip maybe to the next slide um, and the Pacific Northwest, like if you start to think about the impact that this really has, so, for a game in Seattle um, and Vancouver as as sites, so just really think about how that blows out. Portland is close and an easy flight. Eugene and Corvallis, easy sites. Spokane, Boise. We really start to encompass the whole of the Pacific Northwest. Look at two anchor, very big anchor partners with Nike and Adidas being team sponsors for any mm -hmm. of these federations who potentially could come in. Um, the colleges and universities with their ability to not only host you know, teams on the field, but provide additional resources um, there. It, it's just, it's going to open up a whole bunch of different worlds um, that I think we don't traditionally think about when we think about what's happening with the World Cup. We think about, oh, there's a game in Seattle, there's a game in mm -hmm. Vancouver on these days. Oh, maybe there'll be some watch parties in different communities. Yeah, that's going to happen, but there are going to be all kinds of ways that this gets unlocked. Um, you know, if you just think about, you know, in our backyard here, you know, 
with the Nike connection to the University of Oregon and with Nike's campus and the fields there, like there's a ton that's going to get unlocked. And then the potential for brands and companies and small businesses to get involved very at a very local level. I think that's where we're really going to see how this helps the sport of soccer grow in the United States because there's going to be such unprecedented access with the right. of teams in the field. Carl, I want to go to I want to go to this thought here. So I remember 1994. I remember MLS starting, and it seems like there's there's always been these fits and starts. Like, okay, this is when it's going to take off. Okay, this is when it's going to hit. Oh, this. Oh no, no, it's going to really hit. So I'm curious your thoughts about the next five years and. You know, because we talk about growth, generational mm -hmm. growth mm -hmm. of this sport. Dig into that a little bit, because is this now like now we're really talking now we're cooking with gas? Yeah, I mean, Zinger, I think it's all it is already here. It's really just the traditional stick and ball sports that are um, holding on to their fiefdoms a little bit with like the the soccer of the future that never actually seems to arrive. I mean, you know, the average age for all the big four sports is 58.6 and, you know, MLS and everything else is 30. 34, 35, I think. So you're just seeing it now. I mean, the Women's World Cup right now being within six months of the last Men's World Cup, where it's really, you know, doubling down with mm -hmm. younger kids in a very small, um, condensed period of time because of the Winter World Cup last time around has just accelerated. I mean, I have nine, I have a nine year old and six year old. And just, I think sometimes just watching it through the eyes of a younger generation is amazing. It's already, you know, it's always been the number one participation sport, but now kids are staying along and staying in it um, longer. Um, they're not shifting off to other sports. Obviously the decline of, you know, American football participation, things like that have accelerated and helped. Um, but just with the soccer specific stadiums that are around now, the women's game, obviously here in Portland, you know, um, it's on par uh, with the Timbers in a lot of ways. Um, mm -hmm. You know, maybe not full on attendance wise, but real culturally um, driving it, it. It's right there. And then both those, uh, you know, in terms of the Northwest um, are as hot as any other team. So right. I think, yeah, it's, it's amazing when you look at the, the 16 cities here, you know, these are, so this was released in May. Um, FIFA came out with a pretty um, underwhelming kind of uh, logo. If anyone in the marketing world saw it back in May, it was just the clean design of the two six, but um, what they quickly followed with, which we didn't know was actually this kind of decentralized modular approach, which is pretty cool. You know, they've pulled in unique identities for each of the cities. And this is really the big change from every other World Cup where it's mm -hmm. been top down FIFA, the single country. Now they're focusing in on regions. They're focusing in on cities. As you mentioned, for the first time ever, 10 partners are allowed on a local level. And so this is going to make the regional component of the World Cup stronger than it ever has been, which is really cool for us in the Northwest. Yeah. Well, and Carl, I mean, to add on that, the other part that I think is interesting is how then all these sites and venues and how the MLS does lean into this. You know, you talk about mm. sort of the slow growth, like it, it's exploding and it's here and that those even individual MLS identities can tag into some of this bigger programming, which is yeah. going to be, which is going to, you know, again, it drags very different fan bases along for the ride. And, you know, it, I think it's going to open a lot of doors. Yeah. I think the thing that really interests me is the, the flip in how World Cups have been run in the past, where it's very top-down heavy. The Cokes, the McDonald's mm -hmm. of the world have been the title sponsors. And it's been, you know, those few with a few ambush marketers around it. And what it's going to do this time around, not only with 10 local partners in very creative categories, um, is the fact that there's no investment really needed in infrastructure with the stadiums. You know, there's right. some some tweaks needed for field size and whatnot, but it means that those millions of dollars are actually gonna go into things that benefit the region and the cities, um, you know, on a much more regional level. Like I'm, I'm really passionate about youth soccer and sports and that's building fields out. That's helping with the youth sport problem of it being a white collar sport in the North America and making it more accessible um, for other regions and other consumers and be more diver diverse. So I think that's the exciting part is where the investment goes this time around versus it being at the top. Right. Yeah. Agree. Yeah. It, it is nice to see not a bunch of stadiums being built that are then going to sit dormant 
as they have as they have in you know sort of some recent World Cups. Right. I think Brazil still has the Amazon yeah. parking lot now. Where yes. It's, it's like overrun with snakes and jaguars. Yeah. Well, that could be a good venue for an extreme <laughs> sport. Um, um, I like it. Yeah. There we go. I, I want to talk about advertising in the World Cup, and and I think where I'm looking at this maybe coming maybe slightly more through a creative lens. So mm-hmm. it's, you know, it's, the Super Bowl is a different beast and we could have a, a very, a very long discussion about what we think of, of Super Bowl advertising at the moment, not as good as it used to be. Um, <clears throat> but I mean, let's face it, this is massive. Advertising is huge for the world cup. And, you know, again, we've, we, that orange spot that we, that we opened with, yep. That was brilliant. I mean, I'm looking at that. First of all, I, I, you know, being a French miner, I knew what they were saying. Uh, <laughs> but secondly, I just thought, what a, what an interesting and great twist. Um, because I've said this before. Um, I, I've said women are better soccer players than men because I just feel like that the fundamental women are better at the fundamentals. Um, so you can you can yell at me later uh but i've always said that so i thought that was a really interesting way into opening up a very very contentious uh conversation and and discussion um and we're starting to see work that's a little bit more bold a little bit getting more on the front foot Mm -hmm. which which i think is really interesting so what i want to do is i want to play a couple of spots and then i want to talk about where the shift has come and where we believe it's headed because advertising being that vector of how people perceive not just a sport, but the equity in the sport. So let's take a look at a few spot, at a couple of spots here, and then we'll, we'll bring it back here in a second. In all 23, clean up in all 23. And the whole world is wondering, what's it going to take to stop this U.S. team? Easy, luck. We mark Alex. What about Rose? Or Trinity? Poor bloody Rapino. Rapino scores! We could get younger players. They already did that. We have veteran experience. Listen to what you're saying. That is a world-class combination. Their flights could get canceled. Hmm. Seriously? We can steal their place. It's quite simple, really. You train for four years in an AR simulation that mimics their every move. Yeah. Initializing crystal done. I got it. We go back in time and stop them from ever playing soccer. It's a great game. You'll love it. Wait, are you just describing the plot of Terminator? What's it going to take to stop this U.S. team? You play faster. Slower. Rougher. Nicer, eh? Play with passion. With style. With precision. Je ne sais quoi. I mean, the entire world is going to do whatever it takes to stop the U.S. Good luck with that. All right, there we go. First one from Adidas, second one from Fox covering the Women's World Cup in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, hat tip to my South Jersey sister, Carly Lloyd, for being in that. Uh, I, I actually publicly, uh, I, I put a reply on one of her Instagram posts. I said, I'll give you $50 if you say yo uh, during the coverage. So I hope she takes me <laughs> up on that. Um, but this is very different. This is getting, I don't want to say closer to how you know, men's soccer is, is advertised. I mean, but it is, I mean, it's just, it's, it's changed. So Carl, I'm interested in some of the shifts. Let's start with you. Some of the shifts that you've seen, because this just, this just feels like soccer advertising now. It's not women's soccer advertising. It just feels like soccer advertising. Yeah, exactly. I think, you know, obviously credit to, to Adi and Nike for driving the train for so long you know, Nike going all the way back to the, you know, the Brazil at the airport spot that debuted, you know, with inserting 
you know, fun and playfulness and into the Yoga Benito uh, beautiful game concept. And now you're right, it's spilled over into women's where it's 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 part of culture now. You're seeing it with the music. Um, you know, one qualm I have with the Audi spot is I wish they didn't have to use Beckham and Messi to sell the women's game. I think mm. they could have done without the cameos, but that's that's a bit of a nitpick. Um, but yeah, you're you're seeing it, you know, cross over into the mainstream. It's long form content that um, people just love to watch now. And they're making stars of these players and they're, the, the players are kind of making stars of themselves. You know, mm -hmm. everyone knew Sophia Smith largely before she went over and she's emerged as the big star. And if if you follow some of the Nike work that they've done, they've broken out vignettes for each of the star players. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it's like six or seven in total where they each have their own spots to uh to fall out of just the hero you know um spot so that's really cool yeah uh lauren well i th i think what i really love most about like how this does differ from like a super bowl advertising is right in the super bowl it's does it sometimes leans into football it doesn't always sometimes mm -hmm. it's just who can be the most creative and out of the box or it's advertising that they know they're going to repurpose in a lot of other places. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's uniquely different. This is a month long tournament and it's a lot of conversation that really as a brand from a brand side allows you to lean into the fandom and really what makes, you know, it's that link between product and a, and a sport that people are passionate about and experience that they're all sharing in the fandom and just, as people lean into their fandom, it's like, it's a passion like no other. And there's been a bunch of research about what that does for brand lift and conversion right. and those sorts of things. So it's like the fact that these things are, these ads are being cr incredibly creative and leaning right into the heartfelt moment and that, that everybody's passionate, right? Like even when your team drops out, you don't stop watching the world cup. Like, right. like that's the beauty of it. A lot of times, you know, America, we watch American football and your team goes out and yeah, you maybe lose, lose a significant chunk of fans who they don't care if their team or the big team mm -hmm. isn't in there. Like, you know, this, like everybody watches all the way to the bloody end and it's great, <laughs> right? Like it's just, it's a moment and you're, right. and you're connected to people all over the world. And I think the bigness of it um, is really something that's special. I mean, like, I mean, you see people like, you know, Dorito and Lay's came out hard and Visa has re-upped with the U.S. Um, Soccer mm -hmm. Federation. And they've said that half their money is going to go to, you know, men's half is going to go to women's. Like, I love the way the sport is being supported at the highest level and across both genders. And I think, you know, I don't know if Carl mentioned it earlier, but um, like kids today, like they, they don't care. Soccer is soccer. Yeah. Men, women running around, who cares? And that's where, you know, it's going to be interesting. The interesting play as, as the Women's World Cup goes forward is going to be to see what happens with media rights. But I think the advertisers have already have already proven yeah. with their dollars and with their creative that like this isn't this isn't a stage that we shirk on for the women. And right. if this is how big the creative and the marketing is coming now for this Women's World Cup, just think about what it's going to be in 26. Yeah. And yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. And Carl, I agree with you. I think that, you know, the halo effect of, of talented players and personalities stands on its own. I, I agree with you again, it's a little bit nitpicky about that spot. I will say also on the record that um, my favorite soccer player of all time is Megan Rapino. Um, watched her play when she was at U of P. Mm -hmm. And I got a chance to interview her and Sue Bird for something. And I nerded out and I'm like, you're my favorite player. <laughs> Thierry Henry is my second favorite player. So there you go. There you go. But Megan is pretty, one. pretty good one, two punch there, Zanger. Yeah. But you know what? Megan just, uh, I just, I, I, I could tell when she was at U of P, I was like, number one, great player. Secondly, there's, there's a lot there. There's mm -hmm. going to be something special. And, and sure enough, she is uh, absolutely, absolutely, uh, done that a million times over. I want to shift over to talking about specifically the potential for the Pacific Northwest. So we've got Seattle and Vancouver, BC in the mix. Let's dig a little bit deeper into uh, how the region can take advantage of the unique opportunity in front of it. Lauren, I'm going to pull, I'm going to put this up. Let's start with you. All right. Um, well, I mean, I Carl, sorry, I, I can't read. Yeah, sorry. That's all right. We can Tag team it. I mean, yeah, I think this is just it. interesting. This is yeah. just bringing folks into the lay of the land of where Seattle yeah. is at, right? So they just released these marks, um, as we mentioned, kind of the modularity of it. And this was their post back in May, you know, starting to describe the story 
um, that they're putting out to the world already, you know, with their campaign, their marketing, kind of their unique selling proposition is the Emerald City. And, you know, what I love is that they are, I think I would say already out of the 16 cities who I've been monitoring, they're probably in the lead of really pushing this community sustainability focus. Um, FIFA is taking more of a sustainability focus. They just had um, a conference with all 16 cities in Seattle two weeks ago, mm-hmm. but Seattle has already um, really started pushing this and you can, we'll, we'll get to it in a minute, but you know, you can see it from the partners that they're signed. So on the next, on the next image here, yeah, Lauren could talk a bit about this because they've already put their commitments out there, which is awesome. Yeah, it's great that they're, you know, I, I feel like Seattle is so true to, to what they are and what they've, what the position they're trying to stake in the, in the sports world, right? Like this, this sense of being a good partner for the environment and really trying to do some good global impact, good from um, the sports standpoint. I mean, it started with, you know, the Climate Pledge Arena and the Kraken when, when that mm-hmm. opened. Um, and it's really just an, a position they're looking to own. I think, you know, the zero waste is going to be something that is is big and they're going to continue to lean into. Um, accessibility is is huge and it's just something that is important as we lean into this going forward that I think it's going to be a big commitment for them, again, as we talked about, not mm-hmm. just at the point of a game, but all around. Um, how are we making investments in new fields, new facilities, um, and just getting the game more accessible to everybody? Um, the small businesses with the new partners are going to be huge. Um, mm-hmm. I think one of the things that I'm interested to see when we think about small business, um, how is like an industry like the CBD industry mm-hmm. going to come into play as, oh, as a local yeah. partner, you know, as something that one. could be very controversial, but I think um, it's an industry that has a ton of money. And we'll see a lot of, uh, you know, potential new consumers with tourism coming in. Uh, that can be a whole different conversation that I think is going to be super interesting. Um, so it, it'll be interesting to see it all coming forward. I mean, there is there is so much that's going to change in the way we think about sport um, coming into yeah. this new localization. One, one thing that I would add to this, too, is so there there, there were some criticisms in Cotter and you know, a lot of it deserved, right? Yep. So, you know, we're laying a lot of this out. <clears throat> and my sense is, especially in a market like Seattle and specific and Vancouver and in the Pacific Northwest, it, it occurs to me that the accountability side of it, like making sure that we're actually doing the stuff mm-hmm. is, is going to be huge. And it's just one of those things where it's like, yeah, you know, this is what we're doing. We're not going to try to sports wash it or green wash it or any of that. It's I get a sense that there's going to be, you know, very, very much keeping this thing tight. Yeah. And that it and that these, you know, when when it all closes up shop in July of 2026, that these are all investments and legacies that are going to go three, four, five, ten years beyond Mm -hmm. just, you know, having 10 games in um, the backyard up in Seattle. So, I mean, I fully agree, Zanger, that that's, that's the, you know, FIFA likes to talk out of their mouth around legacy, but this hopefully, and for, I would say the takeaway for anyone on this call, if it was, if it was anything for me, is that we're all close to or connected into some level of involvement in the Northwest from brands to clients, to new potential clients, creative work, et cetera, that um, knowing that the North Star from Seattle is setting out on this course being on the ground floor with brands, helping communities, whether we're official partners or not. And I would even say more so in the not category, because that's just going to be quite frankly, most of the business out there. Um, It's good that this is something that we can draft off of and and kind of hold up to and knowing that Mm -hmm. visitors around the world are going to be here um, with that takeaway of the region already from what Seattle's doing, that it allows others to kind of ride those coattails and start telling those stories and do good kind of for their, you know, little bit of contribution to wherever you are, if you're in Eugene, Spokane or Seattle. Yeah. Let's add to the legacy piece of it. This was a very important part of it in Seattle. Yeah. So they made this announcement um, last month um, and it was really cool because as I mentioned, most are waiting until September when they find out how many games they have to really go and properly announce and sign partners. But Seattle, um, you know, I was really happy to see us. They had their, 
S together, um, and they managed to curse. Out it's fine. And, uh, <laughs> and signed their first legacy supporter, which was the um, the uh, indigenous tribe up in in the region there. And it just in showed Puyallup, yeah. Yeah. kind of putting their money where their mouth is yeah. that they're going to take a different approach to who they're partnering with um, and the communities that they're going to be lifting up. And, and I think this just sets the course out of the gate and it allows all of us in the creative and marketing and business space to, um, you know, play a role in some way um, around this. Yeah. Let's, let's, Lauren, we're, we're going to go to you on, you know, like, how do we bring this alive? So I, I, you know, we're breaking down sponsors. We got the biggies, but you know, we've, and we've talked a lot about this. So what I would like to do is take a look here um, and, and talk about, the different ways that brands can play? Sure. Um, I mean, we, we obviously have, you know, there's, there's through the front door, um, cough right. up, write a big check, become an official partner. Um, FIFA has their global partners. Um, and those are, they're big, they're protected. They spend a lot of money. They have exclusivity. Um, they're very much legacy partners and they have a lot of the programming that they've been doing for years. Um, and, and they'll, they'll change that. They, you know, Coke, for example, takes it right down to, you know, the local bottling level and, and that's, they've sort of got a playbook and that's going to be the way things are going to run. Um, we talked a bit about the host cities and their levels of partners coming in. Um, and there's going to be an important strategy, right. And that's where this group is going to come in. And it's whether, whether you're an official partner at that host city level, um, or whether you're sort of, we can call it a supporter, it could be an ambusher, um, but how are we really, as players in the Pacific Northwest, taking advantage of, of what's going to be here? Um, so I think that's sort of one way to go. Um, U.S. soccer certainly has their partners um, who are another important way to go that's going to keep keep people closest to the sport in the purest sense of the sport um, in and around activities leading up to that. Um, but another big piece is really um, how athletes are being leveraged. And I think we're seeing that a ton with the Women's World Cup right now. Mm -hmm. And really, like, taking advantage of these great global entities and personalities that, you know, I think the next couple of years is going to be very interesting to see how it plays out. The world of marketing, I mean, as everyone on, on this call knows, like, everything's changing, right? So we always used sort of the pinnacle athletes to help drive a brand message. Well, okay, now we're using that, we're moving down the chain to with college athletes with some NIL work and you're getting not only the pinnacle athletes, but there's a lot more grassroots and how are influencers being used? And I think that's where it's gonna be interesting to see how are local and regional brands being supported at a different level by some of the talent on the player side. Mm -hmm. um, so I, so oh, I think sorry. that's, that's gonna. That's really gonna be. I think the next way we move forward. Mm -hmm. Yep. And quite honestly, this is. It's just gonna be another way to to bring new new brands to the table. Like right. there, there with the Women's World Cup, there are a ton of brands that have never gotten involved in soccer before that are dipping their their toe in right now. And it's gonna remain right. Like what their return on their investment is gonna be. I think is gonna be a big leading indicator for what happens as we head into into twenty six. Yeah, think and these so? are yeah, and these are some of the brands that um, that have jumped in. Yeah, and I mean, like who would who would have thought you know like they could be seeing eBay. I mean, yeah, it's interesting, but that's that's an interesting one. Some of these other brands, I mean, a, a TIAA, Calvin Klein. I mean, a TIAA does not surprise me one bit. Does not surprise me one bit, and, and I, I just have intimate knowledge of this because I worked for the agency that works with them, the Martin. Oh, agency. okay. So well, th this this is this does not surprise me one bit, and, and it's very very smart. It's I know it's a smart play, and it's a gr it's a great you know, in a category that that is proven you know to be a good sponsor. It's just it's interesting because for them to to be on this big stage has was surprising to me just in that they hadn't been here before and I haven't, right. I hadn't, hadn't seen them at a world cup level. Yeah. yeah. No, that's um, brilliant. So that's pretty interesting. You know, like, you know, an Adobe leaning into, you know, some, some very B2B side of things and then like match day, I'm like, all right, we'll, we'll see what that does for them. Yeah. Right. right. What I would add is um, while that's been the last 12 months around women's soccer, um, you know, we're not going to get into it too much on this call, but um, 
I've partnered up with Vision Insights because uh, those guys are great. They track North America wide fan interest. And so something we've started to dig into and what we're discussing with the host cities, but also brands and agencies that just want to get involved in the passion and interest is is diving into, you know, FIFA and soccer fan personas by city and by region. So we can actually go in and now and see in Seattle, in the Northwest, um, what categories, you know, and what alternative categories like CBD or like, you know, the Indian tribe up in up in Seattle that are going to really resonate with that next generation of soccer fan, you know, the 20, 25 year olds um, and with this move towards 26. So we're able to help out by kind of digging in and sorting out and adding you know, for anyone that's looking either to talk to their current clients, new clients, um, it's something that's going to be interesting in the next few months here. Yeah, no doubt. Lauren, um, let's talk about some more takeaways. Um, and a reminder to everybody, if you are on with us live, please, please feel free. Please feel free. That's quite a mouthful uh, to um, put your questions in the comments and we will uh, we will do our best to get those answered before we wrap up here. But Lauren, let's talk a little bit more about about some other takeaways. There's, there's been a lot to unpack here. Uh, talk about some other takeaways that people need to consider. Wow. Um, I mean, other other things that I think we should we should be looking at um, in the soccer space specifically. Think about how the Premier League and Champions League and sort of the other, you know the non world cup level and how, how with the, you know, champions league tour coming through here this, this past weekend and, you know, bringing other major brands of soccer coming in, they also come along with their own brands, right? So they're, they're coming along with other new brands that are going to be entering the market. Um, I think one thing that I am looking at and am really interested in is how, how the sense of fandom changes and expands from sort of what we're used to in a very traditional, you know, you're a fan of a sport, you're a fan of a team, um, how that model changes, you know, as we, as we go through, um, there is so much global football to be consumed, right? There is, mm -hmm. there, there is always a tournament going on. There's always something for FIFA. Um, there's always something for the fan and just how um, brands and agencies are leaning into that passion in a more agnostic way almost. So, it, so it's not about the league or the specific tournament, but really leaning into the love of the game. I think, you know, one of the takeaways, that's one of the big ones for me is where, how that's going to evolve. Mm -hmm. Before we move to you, Carl, uh, a couple of things. Number one, um, my third favorite player. Um, <laughs> really? She's great. Uh, Lauren they can drive her back in their spot, which is awesome. She's uh -huh. she's great. Um, explain the bobblehead, please. Our bobblehead, Jim Warsaw. Yeah. Uh, Jim Warsaw is the founder of the sports business program here at the University of Oregon. And Jim is, was a great man in the licensing game, um, founder of our program here in the College of Business, where Carl and I both uh, – both went through for some schooling and it's an honor for me to be here helping lead the next generation of uh, sports leaders. Um, so it's really fun for us over the next couple of years, we are going to, as a center, be hyper-focused, uh, connected really closely with Carl. Um, we hope because we know he's going to be driving some big things, but um, our goal between now and 26 is to um, it's kind of, I call it the duh moment, anything that's happening in and around, in and around the, uh, heading up to the world cup in 26 we will have students there uh we will be doing research we will be helping brands we will be helping the event happen um that that's why we're here so um one of the things we hope for is if there's ever a way that we can be a help or an assist um whether it's a great student worker standpoint or you need some extra brain space on some projects um give us a call we're here we uh we love to help out we've got a long history of doing it and we do, we do Jim proud by making sure we're, we're showing up where people are showing out. So. Mm, yep. Amen. Carl, takeaways on your end. Yeah, I think it's, you know, three things that come to mind are whether you're involved in sport or not, this is going to be such a huge cultural moment that it pretty much affects the entire industry in some form or fashion. So um, 
the second one is don't don't wait around because it's going to be coming and it's going to be you know a red ocean in two years where every brand and everyone is trying to jump in with some sort of message but to lauren's point there's dozens of these soccer moments locally regionally internationally happening every few months that if you just think about um you know a good way to link your business or brand or mission into it, um, you can really get started kind of on a grassroots level and build up to it so that you have some authenticity when the world visits, right, our backyard so that you're not just jumping in late. Um, and, you know, September in two months from now, or gosh, just over a month is going to be a big, big period, big launching off point. So keep your eyes open for where Seattle and some of these other cities go. And uh, I'm here to partner with Lauren and the students and any um, brands as well that, uh, you know, I really want to help kind of bring some of the, um, you know, engagement with the, the community sustainability, some of these more mission driven op opportunities to um, take this moment um, and do something different uh, versus just more of the traditional sponsorship mm -hmm. uh, and marketing that, that we've seen previously. Yeah. yeah. And I, I think what's great is I, I personally am really excited for the Pacific Northwest to sort of lead out on this and be a shining star and be very, what we are, different, creative, and really set the stage for what the rest of North America is doing. I mean, I, I would like nothing better than when we walk away in 26 for the rest of the United States to be like, damn, Pacific Northwest, doing it right. We got to gotta, we gotta look a little deeper into what they're doing because they know what they're doing. Yeah, just, just don't move here. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Come and visit, but don't yeah. stay too long. Right. No, <laughs> rainy, season, rainy season, rainy season. It, it's, it rains here all, all the time. All the time. Yeah, Every day it rains here all the time. Let me just see if we've got any questions here. Uh, no, no questions. Just some high fives. Thank you, all of us, for joining. Uh, Carl and Lauren, thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to have you stand by. I'm going I'm to toss you to the, to the green room, as it were. But thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Hit me up on LinkedIn if you need to. And thank you to all of you for joining us. A reminder, the new thinknw.org uh, is kicking off. So go to thinknw.org. If you are a member, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and thank you so much for your support of our work. If you are not yet a member, get in touch. Z-A-N-G-E-R at thinknw.org. Uh, the first thing I like to talk about is some of the business uh, issues that you have or the business challenges that you have and see where we can all make it happen with our organization and with the industry at large. On behalf of all of us, including our wonderful Think Northwest board, thank you so much to all of you on the board. I love you all dearly. Uh, we thank all of you for joining us. And we're going to leave you with one last video and enjoy the football. The USA can win it all right here. Chastain will take it. This is it. Will she make history? And we're going for a fifth. Oh, what year is it? Oh, it's our year. Sophia Smith, she's so good, it's scary. <laughs> but we can't count out England. They just brought it home and they got a secret weapon, Chloe Kelly. Chloe who? <gasps> we're in the middle of a very important time. The competition is better than ever. Well, wait a minute, wait, just slow down. Like it should be a cannon. She controls the tempo. Got it. You don't. You haven't seen Graske Euro yet. Not anymore. Her delivery is the most reliable delivery service in the world. This is insane. No, this is insane. Hey, whoa, what is this? That's Dabinia. She's from Brazil. She's good. What's happening? It's Otta Hegerberg. It takes everyone to stop her from scoring. Is this Y2K? Uh, I'll get it. How was your nap? Brandy Chastain. Ooh. Ooh. Still got it. Ooh.
Oopsie doopsie. I know it's a lot to process that, and I don't want to overwhelm you, but... Process that faster than fast. Wang Shuan's the heart of Chinese football. Where are we? Alex Morgan makes the hardest play look... Effortless. Who? We've got a new American hero. Whoa. And Sam Kerr, she's flipping the game. Uh, excuse me? It's a good day to be awake, Dad. Whoa. Just ask your granddaughter. What the... Football!